this is an interesting device. It's a remotely accessible switch or switch socket. A uh, smart socket, and it was uh, sent by Matt Ludlow, and he says, Banjaxed, which means faulty, smart socket enclosed. Uh, I've already removed the security screws, that's these, to have a peek myself. I've left them out to save you the hassle. So I've downloaded instructions for this. It looks quite interesting. It's a, it's a socket you can control with an app on your phone, but probably the best function is you can plug it into a internet router. Or router, whichever you want, router, router, some people say router, some people say router, I say router, because it finds a route to the internet. But you plug it, you plug your router into it, and then you plug it into the router, and when you power it on, theoretically, it powers up and it turns on your router, allows it plenty of time to boot up and connect to the internet, and then it can accesses the internet and just pings every so often just to see if the internet's there. If it's not... It guesses that maybe your internet's down, or your router may have crashed, and it'll turn the power off to it, wait for a while, turn it back on, and it'll reboot your whole router. So that's quite an interesting thing. However, Matt said what actually happens is that initially, when it went faulty, it would turn the router on, and then about a second later, it'd turn it back off again. It just wouldn't hold on. The relay was cutting out. And I can show you that. I've got a light here that I can plug in. Let's plug the light in to show you what the light looks like. Not that you'd need to know what the light looks like, but that's what a light looks like. And as to light quality, let's plug it into the smart switch and plug the smart switch in. And the instructions say, well, for a start, it should have powered up. The instructions say that the LEDs in the bottom are the Red outlet will turn on, indicating the outlet is on. It hasn't done that. I didn't even hear the relay start. The yellow LED will blink, indicating no communication with the remote server yet. Then the green LED indicates connection to the internet. So that's not happening at all. I think we should investigate. And my first suspicion here was that it might have had a capacitive dropper in it, and the capacitor may have failed. It kind of hints at low voltage. So this thing comes apart like this. And it's got the power supply, which may hold a charge, like that. So my first suspicion was it might have been a capacitive dropper and the limiting capacitor may have failed because an off, a symptom of that is usually that it charges these output capacitors up, these odd-looking output capacitors, there's a clue. And uh, then when the relay comes on, it's fine. It can power the circuitry, but as soon as the relay comes on, the extra load then pulls that down and it stops it actually... Uh, it, the relay then cuts out again. So looking at this, this power supply, the first thing I'm noting here, it's a switch mode power supply. It's based on a little chip in the back, a little 8-pin chip. Good separation, that's good. Uh, it's got the double insulated uh, output or triple insulated windings. Typical power supply arrangement, the electrolytic capacitor here, let's see if I can actually catch this. Let's zoom down on this. Let's focus on that if I can. Is that going to focus on that? I don't know if that's showing, but there's a slight doming in that capacitor. And the bottom of the capacitor doesn't look healthy at all. It looks kind of like squished, like something has parted company there. Is that That's not really focused. Either that or, no, it's not It's not great. But that's okay. Let's uh, zoom back out and then focus. That'll be fine. Uh, so my first suspicion is that the power supply has failed here. And uh, the, it could be the capacitor has failed, or the capacitor does look extremely messy. So I'm going to change those capacitors. I'm going to find out what their value is, and I'm going to get matching capacitors and put them in. Now, it's interesting to note that when you change capacitors, in one of these power supplies on the output, I shall doodle this down. I shall focus down onto the pad. When you change capacitor, it's important to use a low ESR type. Everything on this side of the power supply, which is the output side, operates at high frequency. So, you have to use what's called a low ESR, low equivalency resistance capacitor. If you imagine a standard capacitor, there's a, a standard capacitor. In reality, the electrical characteristic looks like this. There's a phantom resistor in series with it. And... It didn't used to be a problem in the old days when we had a, a main supply coming in through a transformer and then going through a traditional chunky bridge rectifier and then going to a big fat capacitor. It had to be a fat capacitor because of the low frequency. 
Back then you could use just ordinary capacitors and capacitors back then used to be super reliable. It used to be the simplest type of power supply. And because the mains frequency is either 50 or 60 hertz, uh, the output frequency after it had been rectified would be a series of humps of either 100 or 120 humps per second. And the capacitor value had to be quite big because there's a quite a big gap between them and it had to ride. When these peaked, that would charge capacitor up, but then it had to ride down until the next one humped up and then it rode down again. And that meant the capacitor value was typically in the region of, say, let's take an average value, 4,700 microfarad. Not sure what it is on these ones. I'm not sure if it's actually... Can I read that? It's, it actually is quite a high value. It's 470 microfarad. Do I have any of those? I shall check. 10 volt. Suggesting it might be putting 5 volts out for this. Uh, what does it say the coil is? It doesn't say what the coil is. But it's just a single voltage output from this. Okay. But, uh, so the capacitors uh, had to have a very high value, but it, they generally didn't have necessarily a low equivalency resistance because it wasn't super essential, you know, they were made, the fact they were big in the first place meant by default the resistance was fairly low in the first place. With modern power supplies, you've got your supply coming in and it goes through a bridge rectifier and it charges up a capacitor, almost like in the style of this, but a higher voltage capacitor, which is running at low frequency. That's uh, those ones there. But then it goes through circuitry that then chops that up at very high frequency, it puts it through a transformer, the transformer then couples across, goes through a single diode to the capacitor, and now the capacitor, instead of seeing a low frequency like uh, 100 or 120 pulses per second, it's now seeing a really high frequency series of sort of spikes of current flowing into it. And as a result, the, the value doesn't have to be so big. Well, they've made capacitors smaller in general, but the resistance does become a major issue because it's seeing a lot more of these current flowing in doubt per second instead of that nice sedate sort of like a humping current flow of the older systems. So it has to have a very low resistance. Otherwise, it's going to dissipate heat. And the way these capacitors are made, if you looked inside, you'd see a foil with a sort of etched texture. The etched texture is to create a large surface area. And then on the anode, it's got a sort of oxide film that's formed on it chemically. Then you've got a separator just to keep them apart. The liquid is in there, which mates very closely because the it mates directly onto the, uh, the pitted surface. And the other foil at the other side would also be pitted, but the uh, layer, the oxide layer would just be a natural one, that one. What happens in these breaks down, breakdown is you get bubbles forming and that kind of, it separates things apart. The pressure increases and then the top of the capacitor, instead of being flat, domes up. And as soon as you see a capacitor even slightly doming, it doesn't even have to burst open. If it's doming up the way, it kind of suggests that pressure has risen in there and it's the capacitor's failing. It may have vented some of that electrolyte out. Here's an odd thing now. In the old days, capacitors typically had a lifespan of 2,000 hours. And you think, really? Let's do the math. So if you left something on 24-7 a power supply, 24 hours, uh, should I say 2,000 hour lifespan, divided by 24 hours in a day, 83 days before it fails. But where did they get that value from? Some of them had really weird low ratings. But on the other hand, you look at my, I've got video games, on, are like pinball machines from 1980, um, and they've not been on all the time, but they, but they saw huge arcade use, and they've got the same capacitors in them, and they're still going strong. They're, there's a little bit of extra hum and noise because of the, the more ripple, because they are, have got that slight higher resistance, but they're still going strong. Don't know what that 2000 hour thing was about. Worth mentioning, <clears throat> before I fix this, I'm going to fix this and we'll see if it makes it work. It's worth mentioning that if you get a piece of old equipment and uh, you have problems with it starts crashing and resetting repeatedly or starts, say for instance, uh, well, let's, let's show you what happens in the first place. Traditionally, you've got those humping full wave rectified sine waves and the capacitors good enough that it's going to actually ride across like that. So the end result looks like this. It 
it's a fairly smoothish DC that then goes through the voltage regulator and gives you the solid rock steady 5 volt for the processor. As these fail, as they, they dry out, they, that uh, hump actually goes down much lower before it starts ramping up again. And you end up with a lot more ripple. Now, two ways to measure the ripple. You can get your meter. You can hear hum on audio equipment. But uh, one of the easiest ways on a meter is to turn a meter on, select it to AC volts and stick it across the DC supply, even though it's set to AC. If you normally stick this across a smooth supply set to AC, it will read virtually zero. If you put it across a, an old supply that's got a lot of ripple, you'll be able to measure a rough approximation of the ripple voltage. And that can tell you, you know, if a power supply is failing. And this is useful when you've got old equipment, industrial equipment. Easiest fix in, in old equipment is just to tack another capacitor, get another big suitably sized capacitor, and temporarily, if the problems just start to occur, sold it across in parallel on the circuit board with the other big capacitor and see if it fixes a problem. If it does fix the problem, then it is a ripple problem. But there's no harm in changing. In old equipment, there's no harm in recapping, as they say, changing all the electrolytic capacitors. It's also worth mentioning, going back to the video era, if you have a video monitor and it's a cathode ray tube monitor and the image starts tearing at one side, that's a common sign that the power, main power supply capacitors are failing. Well, that just went off in a completely wrong direction, or random direction. It's, it did go in a wrong direction. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go and see if I can find replacement capacitors. I may also, as a precaution, change the diode. Um... But I'll change both these capacitors if there's any risk, if I've got a suitable one. The arrangement in this is that the supplies coming out, there's a inductor. It goes through this diode, then there's a capacitor, then inductor, then the other capacitor filtering, and then that's a supply voltage output, which will then get uh, regulated on the circuit board if it's not coming off fairly regulated here. So I'm just going to pause momentarily while I do that. Well, it's kind of fixed. That's never going to fit in. Look at the size of the capacitors. The smallest capacitors I had were rated for 35 volts. It turns out that this size they've used, they, they're rated 470 megafarad, uh, 10 volt. And the smallest I could find in that was uh, 470 megafarad, 10 volt, a Panasonic capacitor, but it's 8 millimeters diameter compared to about 6 millimeters for these. And the lead pitch was also bigger. It was 3.5 metre versus these are 2.5 millimetre pitch. So then I did find another capacitor. I just searched purely for size. And I found a capacitor that would certainly fit the bill. But while these ones are rated 10 volts, and I suppose it doesn't really matter, this is a 5 volt power supply. These ones are only rated for 6.3 volts, but are the correct size. They're, they're 6.3 millimetre diameter by the correct height and everything. They're very close to the size of these. And they're low, ultra low uh, ESR equivalent series resistance. Not that expensive to get. I suppose ultimately... It's just a case of what you could fit in. At the moment, these are not going to stay put. Also, I screwed up diode-wise because uh, all my diodes, I, I'm sure I've got some Schottky ones somewhere, the low voltage drop ones, but my standard diode, high-frequency diode, is the uh, UF4001 type series, which is a standard 4 voltage drop, I think. But anyway, I shall plug this in and show it it works, and then I'll give you some more statistics. So everything's clear, it's never going to fit in the box, but if I plug it in, short delay, and then the relay powers up and the system's working again. And the LEDs on the front of this are blinking on and off. That's better, isn't it? It's a solid red. It was very clear that the processor was just continually resetting before, just to be blinking like that. And that was absolutely down to this little capacitor here, which is not only domed at the top, but it's pushed out its uh, little rubber cap at the bottom and lost its electrolyte. So, other ways to fix this. It does appear to be fully isolated. I mean, you could get the correct capacitors, which I, I will order some correct capacitors for this then. Um, it does appear to be fully isolated. It doesn't have mains voltage reference to the logic circuitry at all. I'll just unplug this completely as a precaution. And it runs at 5 volts and draws typically, in its standby state, about 250 milliamps. I would say that if it was communicating, it could peak a little bit higher. But uh, that would be, you know, it's the sort of thing that, if it is fully isolated, let's check that. The circuit board comes out here. 
the electrical connections are going straight to the relay. It is fully isolated from the circuitry. There's no connection through, no obvious connection through at all. That means that if you had one of these and it had screwed up as a quick fix, you could theoretically replace this little 5 volt power supply with an uh, external USB cable and plug it into an external USB power supply. This would be an off-label modification though. The best bet here is to replace the capacitors with the correct ones, but uh, it's just unfortunate they've used an unusually small version. It's also worth mentioning the next one to the... Uh, the one that failed was right next to the transformer, but the transformer doesn't seem to get that hot. I was wondering if it had been a thermal... a thermal issue. But there we go. The problem was the capacitor. I just have to order the correct size to do the job completely. But in the meantime, we know what the problem was. It was a failure of the power supply. And it's a fairly cheap and easy fix. A couple of replacement capacitors will be like 30 to 50 pence or something like that to put that back into operation and get it working again.